So a uh, warm welcome to all of you in the third webinar series of Economics Out of Equilibrium. The Rethinking Economics Network has been organizing monthly webinar series since October on the broad theme of economics out of equilibrium. The first webinar series was on COVID domics, how to fix unemployment in a crisis, and the second was on the appallingly bad neoclassical economics of climate change. Today, we are going to have an interactive discussion on how to define development from gender, cultural, and indigenous perspective. We have with us Professor Ritu Devant, who is one uh, who is the vice president of Indian Society of Labor Economics and a visiting professor at the Institute of Human Development as one of the panelists. And uh, we also have Professor John Klemmer, who is teaching at Kyoto University, Japan. And then we have Valeria, who is a PhD student in the University of Salamanca, Spain. We welcome you all, the panelists, and we are delighted to have you with us in this uh, webinar. And the, the structure for today's webinars will be 10 minutes presentation by each panelist, followed by Q&A of 30 minutes or 20 to 25 minutes. Please get ready with your questions and put them in the chat box. If you find someone asks similar questions, then about that questions in the Q&A box, we will select the most popular questions. And after this webinar, we will be having an informal copy chat. So you are all of you are, are free to join. Now, uh, may I request uh, Professor Ritu to please take her time. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me for this very exciting uh, event. First, I love the name Rethinking Economics. So many of us also feel that uh, we should subvert economics the way it is being taught and the way it is being implemented today. Uh, also, I really like your emblem, you know, where you have the two halves of the world. One is up and one is down. And that really defines, you know, gender very, very much so. And uh, therefore, you know, one of the main components, not only in development, but in fundamental economics itself, that if you integrate any kind, because first let's remember economics is a social science. It's, it's, it's not an engineering science or a engineering, uh, you know, a method that we use. And uh, therefore, when it is a social science, you have to incorporate the study of society, which includes women, which includes indigenous, includes economic, extra economic, many other kinds of issues. Now, uh, to, before we get into the development component, I just want to say that the way economics has been structured historically, and I'm sure all social sciences and even physical sciences is based on the fact that patriarchy is inbuilt and it does not recognize patriarchy in, in any theoretical manner or empirical or any other conceptual manner, any other kind of place. Because economics is really based on what we call, I mean, that's a fundamental of economics, homo economicus, you know, which is the uh, economic man. And therefore, every definition in economics, whether it's growth or development or welfare or anything which you talk, particularly now, I think, after the, in the pandemic situation, that it is fully defined by the monopoly of the male economic being and not only the monopoly, but also the masculinity. So therefore in economics, you have these very strange justifications which come out historically and which are there even today. And simple things like, you know, uh, gender-based wage differentials are welfare maximizing for the greater common good, et cetera. Or you have what is called a, uh, and for this, a Nobel Prize was given. You know, it was called a no, new home economics. I mean, it's not home economics. It's economics with a gender perspective. And then you had uh, Becker and Schulz, et cetera, who said that like develop, underdeveloped countries and developed countries have a comparative advantage in specialization. Women historically and biologically have a advantage in reproduction and housework. And, and this is something which should be maintained. You know, so in a way, it's reinforcing all the gender inequalities which you have at every single level. And if we want to bring development and from a gender perspective and from any other kind of a perspective into uh, discussion, then you're questioning every disciplinary assumption which exists, whether it's rationality, because there's nothing like a common rationality. Rationality is determined 
by your location in production, by your location in the economy, by your location in society, and your location in the reproduction of goods and services. So therefore, economics can never be what, what is called, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a big mantra that we must be objective and we must be neutral, but you cannot be neutral in a non-neutral world. So when we talk about development, we are very, very clearly, we have to be partisan. We have to take the part of those who are underdeveloped, those who are vulnerable, those who are marginalized, and those who are off the page of development. It, this it, uh, functions in, in all sectors because patriarchy exists everywhere. It exists in production, in consumption, in community management. I mean, forest and public spaces, et cetera, common property resources, which are so very essential. And uh, I just want to give two or three examples of the work which I've been doing. One is that the inequality which exists even in the fiscal architecture, that is in taxation. So you have this really, I, I don't know what uh, kind, what insane or inapplicable, or I don't really don't know what term to use, that up to the 1993 period, early 1990s, in France, in Netherlands, in UK, in Ireland, in Africa, in US, in many, many other countries, a woman was not allowed to file her income tax as an independent agent. It had to be compulsory joined by uh, uh, filing of even income tax returns with a husband. And what, it, 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 it was something which was really, it, it needed a movement to be able to say that a woman is not only independent economically, but also independent as a tax paying agent, something which is so very simple. So also where uh, monetary policies are concerned. So of course you have SHGs and self-help groups, et cetera, to say that yes, because the state seems to have absolved responsibility of providing employment to its people. So therefore you have a focus on growth and you don't have a focus on development. And therefore you have a very strange kind of a situation where a little bit of money is given to women in particular, you form your self-help groups and you look after your own livelihood, your own employment and your own welfare. And, and you see this in a macro context. So you find microfinance for women and macro finance where men are concerned. Now, I'm not making this a man versus women issue because that's really not the, I mean, that's, that's totally understood that that's not the point at all. Because when we uh, talk about you know, a simple question which I always ask when I teach uh, gender issues or teach economics, what is the opposite of patriarchy? And I normally get the response that the opposite of patriarchy is matriarchy. But I say, no, the opposite of patriarchy is equality. And this is particularly in the fact of the fact that all women, like all men, are not homogeneous. You have tribes, you have Adivasis, you have what we call the lower castes in uh, India. And therefore you have to perceive the entire context of development in a very specific kind of a manner and in a very broad kind of a manner, which is not only inclusive, but it recognizes people's agency, particularly the agency of women. There are many other examples which uh, one can give where, um, you know, gender exists everywhere. Patriarchy exists everywhere. It's whether you recognize it or don't recognize it is, is I think, our shortcoming. So I was doing this study on roads and the general reaction was that how can roads, roads, of course, lead to development, et cetera, but don't forget they also lead to exploitation, particularly where the tribals are concerned or those who depend on common property resources. The road, where it goes, how it goes, how it is used by different genders is, 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 is a, something I think which really needs to be visibilized. The way women use roads, they use it less often. They, uh, their travel purposes are different because their role in society is different. So it's not as if they only use it to go to work and come back. It's also picking up children from creches, from, um, you know, from uh, uh, collecting firewood and collecting water. So you, and also they travel very short distances. So it's, it's like as if you're the horizon of women is narrow and therefore their mobility, which is of course constrained by various other security factors, et cetera, is also very limited. 
So really, when we talk about development, we, I think we just have to turn the current economics on its head and uh, see it from a totally different uh, perspective. I don't know if I have any more time, but I can see Apilang. So is that it? Yeah? Okay. Thank Do you I so much. No, it's okay. We'll get into it in the discussion. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank Thanks. you so much, Prof. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ritu. I think that was a very insightful um, lecture. I mean, you have given in a short time period of 10 minutes. I definitely would agree that um, patriarchy is inhabit in the economic theories historically and the way you put up the how roads are being used and how a road can be used and it can exploit also and how women are using it i think that's a very insightful and some i really find that um, your mention about women uh, inequality exists even in fiscal policy when not allowed to file income tax independently I, that's a that's a very shocking for me and i was not aware of it thank you so much for that yeah now may i request uh professor john to please take his time let me put myself on so we can see each other thank you thank you very much and thank you Ritu, for that that lead in um terrific um both in your style as well as the you know the very fundamental issues that you've raised so again, in, in my 10 minutes, um, what I was asked to talk about essentially was the question of culture. But I, before getting to the question of culture itself, I actually would just like to add a few thoughts about the nature of economics as it relates to culture. I mean, I, I think it's fairly evident that our present economic system is, you know, led us to a lot of disasters. I mean, it's led us to environmental issues, you know, the environmental problems we face, climate change. And in fact, it's a system of very systematic inequality, uh, not, none of which really should be acceptable basis for you know, any kind of just economic system. You know, that in the sense we've allowed economics, which ought to be our servant, to become the master, it's become but a particular kind of economics, of course, which is driving um, us in, in a direction which I think we realize now is, is so unsustainable. And in fact, I think the notion of, of sustainability, I mean, it's maybe overused sometimes, but it is a useful idea because it does suggest the, the direction which we should be taking if we, if we, in fact, in a sense, define development as sustainability, as creating a, a kind of future of the kind we want to live in, which is uh, responsible to the ecology of which we're embedded, which we're, we're all about, and which delivers uh, issues, you know, questions of, of, of the kind of thing that Richard just mentioned, um, equality and social justice. And if we have a system that doesn't do those things, obviously it is very ripe for critique. And of course, I, I know this is exactly what many of you are engaged in. In fact, if we talk about culture, we want to talk about culture and development, <laughs> it's a huge subject. But if we look at economics itself, I think, I think we can say a number of things about the nature of economics, which don't often appear, I think, in conventional, or, or let's say conventional discussions of economics or discussions of in conventional economics. Um, the first is, of course, that, uh, Economics, in fact, is, is deeply cultural. It's, it's a value subject. And if you simply start to think about the words we use when we, when we start talking about economic concepts, you know, we talk about efficiency, productivity, you know, growth, profit, money, any, any of those, and uh, consumption, you know, we're, we're in fact talking about uh, cultural concepts. We're not talking about something that flowed free of the actual life uh, circumstances of people. On, on the contrary, these are the things which shape everyday decisions and the strategies through which we, I think, formulate, you know, formulate our, our everyday life. And I think that needs to be brought back into discussion that we're in fact, in talking about economic store, we're talking about values. And to talk about values, you're necessarily talking about culture, because this is their, this is their source. Uh, for that reason, economics is also, in fact, about ethics. I mean, it's, it should ideally be an ethical, an ethical discipline, one which is concerned uh, not with you know mechanical models of the way in which an economy is supposed to work as a kind of abstract engine of some kind, but but far from it. That as as a, a, a set of processes which should be delivering uh, good life to people. In so far as that is possible, I mean, it's, it's difficult, easy to talk about these things in theory, but of course we have to also face the practical issues of implementing these kind of things. 
but it, it should, I think, very much be concerned with, with ethics as, as the primary basis on which its economic decisions are made. Likewise, of course, I mean, I think we could almost define, ideally define, a, you know, a fresh notion of economics as, as ecology, or at least if that's maybe pushing it a little bit too far. That to talk about economics without talking about ecology is going to lead us into exactly the kind of you know, uh, problems we have now with, with environmental degradation and biodiversity loss and climate change, which are beginning to become the big frame, I think, in which an awful lot of economic and, and cultural uh, debate is, is occurring, as we know. Um, but I think, I think there's another dimension to this question of culture as, as well. It ha just happened, so it happened that just this last week, uh, Wednesday of last week, seems to be my day for participating in these interesting discussions. I was part of a webinar that was being run from India, from, from Mumbai, by uh, an art foundation. Uh, Ritu may know the art foundation called Marg, M-A-R-G, which is a publisher of a, a very lovely uh, art magazine. It's an, a, a publisher of major books and um, monographs on, on art, primarily in relation to India. Okay. And the title of that seminar was The Economics of Nurturance and Cultural Well-Being. And I like that title. That's what attracted me to it, The Economics of Nurturance and Cultural Well-Being. And I thought it was extremely interesting that an art organization had taken up such an issue. And it attracted me particularly because over the last several years, I've written extensively on the relationship between art and development, subject which has been occluded to a great extent, has been left out. And in fact, when and if we look at many of the, the resisting books that have titles like culture and development, they often treat culture itself as a highly abstract idea, not, not in terms of what we actually do, you know, what we perform, you know, how we fill up our, our lives and in things which may seem a bit trivial at first sight, but are not, such as entertainment, you know, how we, how we fill our time with, in fact, cultural activities. So to separate this from a notion of development seems to me to be fundamentally unworkable. Any notion of development has, by, I, I, from my point of view, at least essentially to take into, uh, not, not just as a sort of byproduct. I mean, I, I'm sure, you know, we too would know this, you know, the old days in which you had sort of, you added, you know, gender to development. It was like a sort of little plus thing you added, you know, as a kind of footnote that that doesn't work. You know, if it's not embedded as the central issue, it, 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 it doesn't work at all. And I think the same is true of the notion of culture, in, including our, indeed, our cultural practices, like, like the arts in their various, you know, various manifestations. Because inevitably, I think, you know, once we start to talk about development, we're pushed always into these kind of definitional issues, but, but they are important. You know, what, what do we mean? What do we want by this process? More stuff, you know, getting growth, um, or do we in fact want a process which is going to lead to a more satisfying life um, that's ecologically responsible and which is also one which expresses ideas of, of justice. Again, the point I think that Ritu is implicitly raised, you know, without that, without that, those notions of equality, you're building a you know, kind of civilization which is based on exploitation of some people by others. And in the long run, obviously that, that really doesn't work at all. So I think in a way, um, one of the, the, the key points I want to make is, is the centrality of culture to any notion of development, but as, as a, a notion of value in itself. I mean, I distinguish this slightly, um, both UNESCO and the UNDP have fairly recently taken out, they published monographs on this, you can, you can find them online if you go to the UNESCO website, uh, the notions of creative industries. Well, what they're pushing is, is legitimate in its own sense, right? Is that, you know, if you're talking about poverty alleviation, for example, people have cultures and many of those cultural forms, their art, their dance, their craft, their theater, uh, whatever it is they do or make can in fact be turned into economic resources for people. And that, that's fine, okay? I mean, that's the kind of pragmatic approach to culture. What I, what I would push for is a more fundamental notion of the embeddedness of culture in any responsible notion of development. Um, you, I don't know if I go as far as to say that development is culture or cultural development should be in fact a fundamental part of, of culture. If you look at most development funding, for example, uh, and you want to raise money for any kind of cultural project, you're going to have problems. 
most 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 aid agencies get very suspicious if you say I'd, I'd like to raise some money to you know promote some kind of cultural activity in whatever target uh, society it is um, and, and that I think signals to us the way in which there's also a kind of dominance of, of in fact economistic notions of development which which need fundamentally tra tra challenging um, I, th I think Valeria is going to talk about indigenous communities in, in a moment, but I, I would also just say a word or two about this. Well, I, I, I encourage my, I encourage them, I can make them, I make my students read quite widely in anthropology, particularly in the field of economic anthropology, okay? And I, I do this for a number of reasons. One is that you don't need to go to science fiction, you can find real world alternatives where society, small in scale, it's true in many cases, therefore with issues of scaling up and all those kind of things have in fact created sustainable lifestyles, sustainable cultures, and in which the relationship between culture and that sustainability is, para is paramount. You know, the, the, you can't really separate those things from one another. And I think this is true actually, not only when you think of indigenous societies, you probably do think of small scale, um, you know, what in India, I think it's still called tribal societies, right? Um, but it can happen in a much bigger scale. I mean, I'm, I'm in Kyoto, Japan at the moment, and as some of you may know, the, the basically indigenous religion of Japan, which even preceded the advent of Buddhism here, is the religion called Shinto. And Shinto itself has embedded in it very many ideas about, about the nature of environment, of human environment relations, and of relationship between cultural practices and enhancing those things. And little, little aspects, as I'll stop in a moment, <laughs> okay, I promise you, little aspects of this which I find quite, quite charming actually show up. On, on the weather forecast every night at the moment, the weather, the weather forecasters not only tell us about, you know, the cold front is approaching, tomorrow's temperatures and this kind of stuff, they tell you where to go and see the nice autumn colours. Because going and viewing the autumn colours is considered a, a you know, culturally desirable thing to do. In the spring, if you're ever here, the same thing will happen with the cherry blossom. You know, and I don't think this is just superficial. I think it does reflect the way in which a culture does. In, in that case, a culture, I think, probably rooted in Shinto, does attempt to embed ideas, or positive ideas of, 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 of ecology or of a re responsible relationship to nature uh, as a very central part of, of social practice. Let me end with just one final point. Often, I mean, when, when I talk to people about economic anthropology, particularly, you know, the question inevitably comes up. People say, yeah, yeah, but how are you going to scale this up? You know, how are you going to, um, you know, turn this into wider thinking about development, uh, development alternatives? Now, we don't have time, but please ask if you want to do this uh, later on. But I would think there are many implications, not only giving us interesting models, but that do in fact link to current debates about alternatives to, to conventional uh, development, including notions like agroecology, where, where more and more people are trying to move back towards an, an environment, uh, uh, sorry, an agricultural system, which uh, does fulfill the basic conditions of sustainability and, and movements like the movement for so solidarity economy, which also in fact raises ideas that are important, I think, because not only do they pose economic alternatives, but they strongly suggest that you can't have an alternative, you can't have a sustainable economy without a sustainable society and culture that goes with it. So we have to find our way back, I think, to linking those things in a much more systematic way than we've done. Though these are a few rather random ideas perhaps, but hopefully we will this will be able to trigger some debate about, about that relationship between culture and development. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't run Thank you. Over time. Thank you so much, Professor yeah. John, for that enlightening lectures on the relationship between culture and development. And I think uh, you made a point that development itself is deeply cultural. So that is, uh, I, I you take that as a, uh, take that as a learning from your short presentation, short sharing. Thank you so much for that. And I, I would agree with you that, um, of course, economics is not just a positive science. It's not a, we need to look at the ethics and it's used as a normative concept. So that's a, that's a, an, an important point that we have to think about. And the mainstream economics has always, I think, left the cultural issues with the thing of the develop, development. So thank you so much for that. And now may I request uh, Valeria to please 
go for next. Yeah, Valeria, please. Valerio, please unmute yeah. yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I want to share some videos with you while I'm developing my presentation in order to show you um, what about I'm going to talk about. So we are trying to share the, the videos. So please wait a minute. Um, here. Wait a minute, please. Could you see the video? Yes. 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 Uh, yeah, but it's so, not played. Can you play it? Could you please? Um, now? No. Mm, so why? I don't know why. Because I, I could say the video. I could see the video playing. Oh, but sorry, it's not playing. So I'm going to start with the video. I think that it was important to show the this this part, but it doesn't matter. So I'm I'm from Bolivia. So I'm going to to share with you my experience talking about my my research, um, my PhD research. So I'm studying the cultural economy that is developed by folkloristic groups here in my, in my country, especially here in La Paz, Bolivia. So uh, this economy is really important because um, it is founded on uh, indigenous values, but it is uh, carried out by an uh, indigenous urban group. And it is linked with um, the Cholaje identity that emerged here in Bolivia uh, as a consequence of um, the Spanish colonization and in the 17th century. But the interesting of this is that over the time, this social group with an indigenous origin achieves a social position in La Paz society. So they keep their traditions and they keep their customs alive in order to show their culture and keep alive their identity. And here is when the patronal feast comes up because these are uh, cultural expressions that are carried out in order to, to show the fate of this social group to a saint from whom they expect favors. But here uh, emerged an interesting cultural, cultural economy because during this patronal feast, uh, especially during the Grand Poder festivity, um, they spent a lot of money. Why? Because this social group thinks that if they want to show how big is their fate on the Señor del Gran Poder, they have to expend a lot of spend a lot of money um, celebrating this festivity and carry it out very very luxury events. So, um, a social, political, and economic system is structured around the patronal feast, and besides, there are strong institutionality inside these patronal feasts, and this system is based on cultural codes such as indigenous rituality, reciprocity, social prestige, and a special system of wealth circulation. Unfortunately, in Bolivia, we don't have a statistic data about this social group. So the research that are carried out uh, use just short samples or just a descriptive analysis. This is okay, but we want to start to try to understand that this cultural manifestation is not just folklore, folkloristic and that's all. This uh, cultural expression is developing a powerful cultural economy. And this cultural economy is based on cultural codes that 
um, keep alive an indigenous heritage that we could find here in La Paz. So what I'm trying to do with my research is try to quantify this cultural economy and try to understand this uh, patronal feast like a generator of a lot of um, in a cultural and creative uh, industries. For example, uh, to part in order to participate in these events, this social group founded um, folkloric uh, dance clusters named Fraternidades, and these Fraternidades has more, have more or less um, 1,000 members. So to participate in the Grand Poder festivity, they need a lot of costumes, accessories, and these kind of things. So for example, this group developed a really, really powerful fashion industry funded on their uh, cultural codes and their a traditional costume. So I think that it's really important to start thinking that uh, this cultural expression is generating a powerful cultural economy. And we have to try to quantify and measure this, um, this cultural uh, economy. The problem here is that sometimes when economies try to talk about these festivities, people think that this area is just limited for sociologists or, anthropolog or, or, or the anthropology. But here we could see that the economy could be rethinking in the order to understand that based on cultural values, um, a patronal feast is generating an amazing and a largest movement of money. For, um, other thing that it's important is that uh, in Bolivia, we have many uh, indigenous uh, nations that are alive here and that they are constantly um, sharing their experiences with this modern environment here in the city and they are keeping alive their costumes and their uh, their traditions and for example here in my city we have this heritage so almost everybody knows about the rituals uh, aymara rituals or quechua rituals that we carry out these rituals also so trying to rethink uh, this uh, economy and try to emphasize the relevance of the values when we analyze culture is really important here in Bolivia because we share uh, almost all the time with these um, Aymara's heritage and with these uh, native cultures here in, in this urban uh, context. So I think that this is what I could share with you. And if you have a, an answer, and if you feel some, if you have curiosity about this social group, I'm going to try to share with you some pictures because we could we can't see the video. But I uh, think that it's important. Valeria, hi, yes. uh, Valeria, someone has said that uh, in the chat that you can share the screen uh you have to share the screen where the video is playing but you are you are sharing the folder actually so maybe you can try that uh, so i'm going to try <laughs> yeah. um sorry but i, I have problems with technology <laughs> okay <laughs> Completely so okay. I'm, yeah. I'm trying. Um, I don't know what happened. Okay. I'm going to try again. Here. Yes. Yeah, it is sharing. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So yeah. here we could see a, a part of the Grand Poder festivity. And this is a folkloristic parade. 
uh, that is carried out in honor of the Lord of Grand Poder, that is the most powerful saint for this social group. And they believe that uh, this saint uh, have the, has the power to make them um, prosper in terms of economic, uh, in their economy. So this is the modern other dance and is classified as a, a heavy dance here in Bolivia because it is symbol of a social status uh, in the Cholaje group. Because if you want to dance morenada, you need a lot of money in order to buy the accessories and the costumes. And we are going to see another part of the video because we are going to we want to understand what happened here, for example. This festivity is carried out uh, around nine months. The festivity starts in November and finish with the amazing Parade of Gran Poder in May or June. So for example, here we could see um, the previous events of, the, of one of the most important fraternidades that is linked with the um, transporte pesado. So it, it's um, um, the, the members of this fraternidad um, are transporters. And here we could see the cultural codes. Uh, what, you, what you saw is the chaya, and they believe that they have to chayar the people in order to have good luck. And this is the commandante, the person who has the honor to guide the, the, the fraternity, the, the fraternidad. And here we could see the pasantes. They are really important in fraternidades because they are elected annually. And during one year, they have to sponsor the all events of this uh, patronal, of this patronal fest. And for example, uh, last year, um, more than 120 millions of dollars were generated approximately during the Grand Poder, and the 91% of these amounts of money were attributed to the Morenada, uh, to the Morenada uh, Fraternidades. So here we could see um, that it's uh, a festivity that it's named um, Recepción Social. And it's a previous event that is carried out uh, in November in order to start uh, with the celebrations and the, pre the preparation of the um, Grand Poder festivity. Here, uh, again, we could see the pasantes. They are, and here we could see that pasantes are really important and they have a security man because they spend a lot of money and finally, I want to share with you a video of the uh, bandas folkloricas here in Bolivia. These bandas have more or less uh, 500 members and they uh, go with the fraternidades around the, um, the patronal feast during the folkloric parade. And we have more than 60 fraternidades and each fraternidad have a banda folklorica that play the Valeria, music for them. Sorry, sorry, Valeria. I think, okay, could you please sum up? <laughs> we are sorry? running out of time. Could you please sum up your points because we are running out of time? Yeah. Yes, so I want to share this because it is important to, to understand what happened with this social group. And this is the economy. So in this context is that the cultural economy uh, developed by this, uh, this social group is developed. So I think that it's uh, important to take account here in Bolivia, the values and the indigenous uh, identity in an urban context to understand the cultural economy carried out in patronal feasts. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Valeria. That was thank you for sharing your research on cultural and economics model developed by the Bolivian folkloristic group and its creative and cultural histories. That was a very interesting. So now we 
to the questions and answers. So we have uh, questions for yeah each panelist. So first we will uh, move on uh, move on to the question first. So this question is for Professor Ritu. So I'll read the question. It can contribution of women in household caregiving services like rearing children and all age old people in a household is not a counting system to make this necessary correction in counting system could you please uh, respond would you like to respond to this professor Ritu? Yeah, in fact, uh, that is an issue we have taken up for a very long period of time. And um, I think there are several countries, in fact, Japan, I mean, John should tell us about Japan is one country which has taken this, uh, what we call component of unpaid work into account. But you know, it's not only rearing children, it's, it's also the whole perception. One is children are, let's not see them as children, they are the future workforce. So what the woman is looking after is the future workforce. And that is why you need state support because they, they are part of uh, you know, the, the economic society in that sense of the term. There is also, of course, uh, so that's the domestic care work, what we say, you know, cooking, cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. But there are several other categories of care work which are also not taken into account. And we've had uh, several you know representations and the last government did take that so we had uh, about a decade ago 2011 and 20, uh, 2004 five and uh, 2011 we did get it integrated into the data system but part of it not all of it because one other component which is not taken into account in underdeveloped countries is uh, the time she spends in collecting water all right, it's and, uh, it, that a rural woman spends on an average three and a half hours to go and walk and collect water, the firewood which she has to collect, and all the other activities which she does in terms of homestead and you know growing vegetables, looking after a horticulture tree in the house, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is a lot of labor which has not been incorporated, women's labor and also men's labor. In fact, I did this study over four or five uh, states in, uh, in uh, uh, India, and uh, I found that if women do, you know, 70% of women do unpaid uh, work, 40% of men also do unpaid work. So I think those are aspects which there was a survey, we made representations over two decades, finally a survey and about 90 districts were selected. And the results have just come out about 10 or uh, uh, well, 15 days ago, maybe. But again, not officially released. This is all leaked data, which we keep getting in uh, India. So there's a lot uh, more in relation to uh, the unpaid work uh, component. Some of us have been working, four or five of us have produced work on that. If anyone's interested, they can always email me and I can share the studies with them. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Professor Ritu. Uh, so the next question is for Professor John. Economics, you say that economics John's video, his video and his sound are both off. <laughs> <laughs> economics, uh, Professor John, uh, you say that economics is deeply cultural. Could you please elaborate this point? Ah, oh, there he is. Oh. Certainly, okay, <laughs> certainly. Um, well, let's take two, two, two ways. First, the, fir the first is that if you want to do a little like kind of, kind of philosophy is simply to analyze the, the, the terms, the concepts that economics uses in, in its explanatory frameworks. So, some of which I, I mentioned earlier. I mean, take words like money, efficiency, productivity, you know, consumption, um, or whatever, whatever you like begin to examine them, you find out, first of all, that they, they have a history. I mean, they've, they've come from somewhere. They've, they've come from some kind of the cultural history of the society in which they, they're embedded. Uh, they're, they're not just abstract terms which describe the world. In fact, there are some interesting economists, uh, for alternative economists, who've been even arguing for the idea of, 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 of economics as what they're calling a virtual science, that is to say, uh, not, not a science which describes the world, but a, a science which tries to construct the world by convincing us that certain words like productivity, growth, and so on, 
are the models that we should understand the world through. And, and that's con very contestable. So I mean, one, one level is, is therefore to examine um, economic concepts and see the way in which they are in fact embedded in culture. They do, they do reflect values. I mean, a second, a second issue would be in fact, that I think Valerius very beautifully just illustrated, right? Which is um, this notion of cultural economy that she's been, been operating with, uh, again, shows the embeddedness in fact of, of huge numbers of cultural activities in, um, uh, of economic activities in culture. Now, again, we don't have time to talk about a lot of examples, but I, I was interested that she showed this, these kind of um, performance type uh, events happening in Bolivia. And in fact, because this illustrates something very, very interesting that, that conventionally econ e uh, economists have a huge trouble with, which is the value of art. I mean, if I, if I happen to own a, a, a painting by Picasso, its intrinsic value is almost nothing. I mean, it's maybe a piece of canvas on which some uh, you know, middle-aged Spaniard um, daubed some oil paint. It's in terms of the value of the, of the materiality of the product, it's almost nothing. Its materiality, its value derives not from its materiality, but from cultural value, which is attached to certain processes, objects, or services that provide. So I think if you take that approach as well, you find immediately that you can't, you can't really talk about economics without detaching it from uh, its cultural embeddedness. And I think that's something that, that I say, encouraging my, my students to read economic anthropology is important because when you look at those kinds of examples, you see very quickly the way in which uh, economics is embedded in culture or they're embedded in each other. I mean, they form actually a kind of holistic holistic um, pattern. So I hope that's at least a partial uh, answer to your question. Thank you, thank you for uh, John. Okay, uh, so we have also questions for uh, Valeria. So Valeria for you is, what do you think, what, uh, what do you think would be the impact of including the economic aspects of large cultural festivities in the conception of value? I had a problem with the connection. Could you repeat the, the question, please? Okay. So uh, what do you think would be the impact of impact of including the economic aspect of large cultural festivities in the conception of value? I think that it's really important because if we talk about the impact, the, the economic impact of the festivity. Now we we have this date in uh, this data in Bolivia that more than 120 million of dollars are generated with this uh, folklorist um, event. But here, um, this this information is um, elaborated by the um, government of La Paz City, but they commit they make a mistake because they talk about and other industries, for example, in these uh, celebrations, the beer is a really important issue. Uh, so they include the production of beer here in this, in this amount of money. But if we want to, to really know the impact of this um, cultural celebration, we have to focus on the production of the, indu uh, of the creative and, and cultural industries carried out by this social group. On the other way, I think that it's really important to, to include the values in the analysis because in Bolivia, we don't have a statistic data about this social group because they are not identifying as a special social group here in the society. We say, yes, uh, there are many people who dance Morenada and who participate in, in this patronal feast, but until today, we don't, that, we don't have information to say, okay, we have this patronal festivity and we know that there are, I don't know, two million of people who dance here because we can't um, characterize them uh, according to these values, these cultural values. So we are commit, commit me a mistake because we are not including the values in order to Characterize uh, the 
the actors of a cultural economy. So that's why we don't have that statistic and we don't have empirical studies about this cultural economy and we are not measuring correctly the impact of the values and the impact of the, of the economic activity of these festivities. Okay, thank you, Valeria. So uh, this question is for all the finalists, whoever wants to respond. So given that we know the desirable state of equal ethical and ecological development and economics, what are the biggest barriers to, re to, that, uh, to reach that state? Professor Ritu, would you like to ask? Uh, very good question? Uh, question, very <laughs> fundamental uh, question. And uh, it's like, uh, in a way, what I called, um, you know, there are terms which John also used these words like profit and growth, et cetera, et cetera. So, and what I, in fact, that's your fundamental purpose to think of rethinking economics. And it's like, uh, you would have all read this wonderful book, no uh, Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent. So there's this also the thing of a manufactured economics, you know, seen in a, and literally manufactured. So you get that in the syllabus, you get that in the universities, you get that in every kind of calculation, all kinds of media, etc. And everything is judged through growth. And uh, therefore you have alternate measurements which are there, which need more of a push. But I, I really think it's rethinking economics, it's rethinking the whole development paradigm. And uh, also, I mean, what I, I really like what John said, and it, it's for me, it's not only culture and development. I think it's a culture of development also, you know, which is, is really, which is very essential. The answer is very long. Huh? So I, I'm just uh, <laughs> cutting it short. Maybe the others would like to uh, come in there. You know, it's it's this kind of uh, what you have asked is it's not profitable for anybody to uh, for the companies which control everything. I mean, j just see in the pandemic, the it it is shocking, and it's not only India; it's everywhere that the rich have grown richer and the poor have grown grown poorer. All right. Now, which is not so much only the pandemic, but the politics of the pandemic and the policy of the pandemic, all right, which is uh, uh, is uh, in operation in, I mean, in our country, I can say that the policy or the lack of policy response to uh, the pandemic is what has created many more problems than the pandemic itself. And uh, so therefore, when you know, when you talk about an economics that's equal, it also has to be egalitarian. It also has to be, of course, the ecology component, the ethical component, and also empathy. I think there is just no empathy for those who are marginalized and those who are visibilized. And, and this is like when I've been working for migrant workers during this period, and they, they put it very simply. They said, we are not required Indians. You know, there's so much unemployment. So if a few thousand of us die, it doesn't bother anybody. In fact, right now, there's this huge demonstration of farmers, which is going on in Delhi, which is freezing cold. And what the state is doing, what the police are doing, is throwing water on them in this freezing cold. There's no compassion, there's no humanity. And I think that is really what defines economics and what we have to get back into economics. Professor John? John, John will add on a yeah. lot more. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, my, my, my answer will be very short, it's very simple. Okay, one of the barriers, I think there are two barriers, okay? One is the business as usual thinking. You know, that is to say that even, even you know, a lot of us are now thinking about, you know, post-pandemic futures, what, what, what creative things may come out of this. I think, I think the large forces that we'll have to face are in fact that the, the pressures go simply back to what was there before in economic terms, you know, reestablish the, the old stuff, the old way of thinking. And that, that would be very, very dangerous. So if, if this is, if the pandemic is a kind of portal to fresh thinking, I think the first thing we have to confront very much is, is or to oppose in fact, is the return to, to business as usual. The other thing is, I think thinking as usual, 
<laughs> okay, that's it. But I, I'm what is I think very creative about uh, you know the discussion we're having now is is the uh, the fact that not everybody is thinking as usual. Uh, the question will be, I think, how to translate that not thinking as usual, that real thinking about alternatives into into practice. That won't be easy, but I, I think I think it is the challenge that comes out of of the kind of debate we're having tonight. So that's my very short answer. Yeah, thank you. Are. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. Thank you so much, Professor Ritu, Professor can John. I, can I just, I just saw the questions and I would just like to say one thing. Can I okay, can sure, sure. have a minute? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yeah, I just say go. there's something, you know, which links up what John has said, what uh, Valeria has said, and some of the questions which have come. And that is this whole, how is the cultural issue perceived by the current, you know, dispensation, the economic dispensation, which is something so important. And I just want to give you one example. And that is the issue all heard of Kashmir. And uh, there is this community of, uh, you know, cattle herders, grazing community called Bakarwals and Gujars, etc., who go to the higher reaches for grass. They're, they're grazing. They are. They don't have any rights. That's. I'm not getting to the issue. But what they do, they live uh, at the ground level, and then they go up to get the grass. They go up to the hills, to the Himalayas, to the mountains, and there they make mud houses to live in, which they leave open for six months of the year. Nobody enters. Nobody breaks. Nobody steals anything. That's a culture which exists for a very long and a very sustainable culture which exists for a very long period of time. And now what is being done in the last four days is that in the name of encroachment, this is their own land. This is public, public land, you know, what we call uh, the public common property resources. And this is the right of everybody, including nomads. These are nomads who are there, that their houses are being broken. So which means economically you're out, culturally you're totally out. And in, in any kind of a, you know, ethical or whatever manner. There are several questions, but they can also be emailed at some point of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Valeria, would you like to say any final comment on the questions? Would you like to add? No, uh, thank you. It was a pleasure to share with you. And it was an honor to share with the professors this virtual space. So I think that I could here I could read some some answers, so I'm going to tr to try to to answer all the questions about these festivities. And it was really nice to share with you Bolivian culture. <laughs> so thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ritu, Professor John, and Valeria for sparing your time for us.